Well, welcome to the Hump Day Hangar presentation sponsored by supercub.org and the Not So Straight and Level podcast. If you've never heard of it, supercub.org is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, motion backcountry flying community forums on the internet. Tonight's presentation will be the last HDHP of the year. And I'm very excited to have the man who launched the inaugural HDHP in April with us to close out this year's programming. Including this evening's program, it's hard to believe that we have done 28 of these Wednesday night presentations. If you've not seen all of them, be sure to check out the playlist on, your YouTube, on our YouTube channel. Tell your friends, share the videos. These presenters go to a lot of work to bring these programs to you, so please let folks know about them. Bill Rusk, our presenter this evening, is a consummate aviator. He's a longtime contributor, both in his vast sharing of his knowledge of building and flying and his membership support of supercub.org. Bill's a friend and mentor to so many of us. It's my sincere pleasure to again welcome Bill to the HDHP stage. Welcome, Bill. Okay, Steve, thank you very much. And thanks everyone else for coming out this evening. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm gonna start out and just say, Hey, Bill Rusk, folks, I am just your average guy. I'm not one of those guys that grew up in a machine shop and was building race cars at 13 years old, or I'm not Doc Randy with a PhD before I went to med school or anything like that. I'm a pretty average guy. Uh, for those of you who do know me, I'm sorry. Uh, but we'll, we'll try to make this uh, program this evening hopefully a little bit interesting and, and something that you can enjoy and maybe get something out of as well. So I'm gonna hit uh, screen share here. And uh, that way you guys won't have to look at my ugly mug too much more, maybe just a little bit off to the side. So uh, jump in and say, I'm gonna jump in and say one thing I forgot to say. Folks, if you'll use the chat function in Zoom or on YouTube for questions, I'll be monitoring those. And if it seems appropriate to interrupt Bill uh, during the presentation, I'll do so. Or I'm sure he'll take some questions at the end too. So. That's all I got. Sorry, Bill. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. Okay, so, um, you know, I grew up building and flying balsa model airplanes, and my first job was actually working in a hobby shop at 15 years old selling model airplanes, and boy, talk about paradise for a kid. That was great. So, somewhere in high school, I discovered that you could actually build a big model in your garage and actually fly in it, and so that started the whole concept of home building and building an airplane, at least for me. Of course, life... Um, college, careers, wives, kids, all those things came along as well. So it took a little time. But in 1990, I went to Oshkosh and discovered the Hats biplane. And remember, folks, even though I loved Super Cubs, in 1990, you couldn't buy a kit and you couldn't buy plans. And I didn't have enough money being a broke naval or a, a broke um, Air Force uh, pilot uh, to, to go out and buy a Super Cub. So so anyway, I started fooling around with a hat spy plane, 150 bucks for a set of plans and, uh, and a couple hundred dollars in materials and you're off and running. Um, let's see, Steve, uh, there we go. This is what a hat spy plane looks like. And it's basically a cub with two wings. It's really docile, easy and fun to fly. So I started fooling around with a hat spy plane. And then a little while later, uh, managed to get enough money with a, a loan to buy a Cessna 170. And the Super Cub group was kind enough to let me hang out with them. I'm a Super Cub wannabe at this point. Uh, so I got to go to some of the Super Cub gatherings in my 170. They even let me play in some of the short takeoff and landing contests, toll contest in the 170. I just had a great time. Um, and so he beat all the Super Cubs, by the way, folks. Nah, nah, just, just that was a long time ago. So anyway, this was a hats by plane that I was building up. I learned to weld and you guys will get a kick out of this. See those ribs in the uh, stabilizers? I was a weight freak even back then. So this is kind of how I started on home building. Uh, those are the four wings. And then along the way, I helped a guy a little bit with this one and actually had an opportunity to own this airplane with Dave Zygmunt as a partner for a while. And uh, so I got to give a bunch of rides in a biplane. And I tell you what, biplanes are absolutely a lot of fun. And this one was very, uh, just a magical airplane. And of course they're chick magnets, get to give beautiful women rides. And so Christian Sturm from our community, named his house and we got to fly. Uh, here's a chance to hear the old radio engine. Max, hot. Drop clear. Clear. 
So uh, in 2004, I discovered Nick Smith and uh, the Smith Cubs. And Nick was the first one to really offer a kit of a Super Cub. And so sold the hats project and invested all my time and money in building this airplane. Spent a season uh, flying it on skis and uh, wheels and then put it on Bauman Amphibs. These are straight floats. Um, and so now my dream is alive. It's 2010, I'm heading to Alaska in a cub on floats and that was my big dream. So here we are in South Dakota, we're heading towards Spokane where I'm gonna visit with Christian Sturm. And somewhere along the way, I decided to land in the Clark Fork River. And folks, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the mishap, but if you Google search Bill Russ down but okay, it'll take you directly to the thread on supercub.org where I wrote up a little bit more information, maybe a little bit more detail if you wanna read about the mishap. So decided to land in the Clark Fork River. This is a, a view of the river. You'll note that the bank is quite high and quite steep. You may also be able to see a little ramp to the uh, left side of the screen. When I tried to swim for shore, I was going for that ramp, but I didn't make it. I ended up being swept downstream by the current. And so I ended up again on a real high bank, made it difficult to get out. So here we are. I decided to land in the Clark Fork River and um, things happened really fast and really, really violently. I went from, I'm flying and flaring, and I cocked my head a little to the left to look out the left side to judge the flare, because obviously you can't see over the nose. And the next thing I know, I'm underwater. I mean, it was instantaneous, extremely violent, and there was just no feeling of landing or touching down on the river. It just went from flying to upside down in the water. Fortunately, I had spent some time chair flying this particular event and thinking about you know, worst case scenario is a float plane flips upside down. So I had chair flown this event. And uh, so I managed to get out of the airplane okay, inflated my life vest. Uh, the water is very cold. It's in uh, the early part of June when this happened. And um, uh, I had flown through a couple of snow showers before my landing on the river. The water temperature is probably 30, 40 or 34 or 35 degrees. It's, it's snow melt and uh, there's, the river is high. The current's probably pretty fast, reasonably. And uh, there's probably debris in the water, although I didn't see any. Um, <clears throat> as I worked my way around the airplane to get to the backside of the airplane because I could stand on the fuselage, which was underwater, um, I saw a big, huge gaping hole in the uh, right float, just in front of the step, just a huge gaping hole. So I suspect that I hit something uh, that I didn't see under the water. But anyway, um, one of the things that happened, and it, it, we'll talk a little bit about it as a lesson learned, is as soon as this happened and I ended up underwater, I knew that I was no kidding in a full-blown survival situation at that point. The water was cold. I knew hypothermia was going to be a serious problem. And I knew I was in a world of hurt right off the bat. So I got up on the backside of the floats. So I'm standing up in about chest deep water right now. And uh, obviously, again, very cold to wipe the water out of my eyes and got a right hand full of blood. So I knew that I had an injury there. Um, but I covered up one eye and I could see covered up the other eye. I could see, okay, so I know I can see out of both eyes. And so I don't care about bleeding at that point. Um, I managed to activate my spot and uh, start the search and rescue uh, issue there. I also got on my cell phone and before it died from water ingestion, I did manage to send a text to my sister who was following the trip, told her that I had crashed on the Clark Fork River and I needed help. And then she was able to also start some of the uh, rescue efforts. So now I'm sitting on top of the airplane floating down the middle of the river, uh, very cold, shivering, and trying to figure out which side of which, where do I go? What do I swim to? And uh, There's a road that follows this river up the valley, and it is a beautiful valley. I've since flown it numerous times. It's a great place to fly. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, but there's a road that follows the river, but it goes from the west side, and then it has a bridge and goes and follows the east side for a while. And then there's a bridge, and it goes on the west side for a while, back and forth. And I honestly didn't had no idea which side of the river the road was on. And I knew that if I swam to the wrong side of the river, I was probably toast uh, because of hypothermia. Um, and uh, fortunately, a lady drove by in a truck. And so I knew which side the river was on. I communicated with that lady and she helped me get to a house. I, I did manage to swim to shore. By the time I got to shore, I was really starting to lose all my muscular coordination because of hypothermia. I've been in the water about probably 25 minutes or been wet 
total of about 20, 25 minutes at this point. So um, the last part of the swim to shore was really tough. My arms weren't functioning and my legs weren't functioning and it was pretty ugly. But I eventually got to shore. The lady helped me get to a house. We put a heating pad on my chest and a heating pad on my back and then rolled me up in a blanket waiting for the ambulance to get there. Once the ambulance arrived, uh, they put me in the hypothermic uh, sleeping bag that they carry, and that allows them to put uh, heating pads under your arms where your uh, veins and your vessels and arteries go close to the surface and also between your legs where your femoral arteries are close to the surface, and that helps to uh, stop some of the temperature loss. And then they put me on uh, heated oxygen, which was really uncomfortable to breathe, but it helps a whole lot so that you don't lose body heat uh, with each breath that you take. So they got me to the hospital in Sandpoint. I'm pretty much out of it. Um, still conscious, but but not much. And uh, the doc looks at me and he goes, oh man, you've busted the bones around the, the, uh, the ocular socket here um, and we need to put those back in place. And so I hear all this crunching and grinding as he's pushing these bones back into place around my eye. I didn't feel anything. I was out of it, but but I'll never forget the sound of that crunching and grinding as those bones get moved. And then he put seven stitches in my eyelid and uh, just looks like another laugh line now. But again, I don't think he used any painkiller at all. And I didn't feel a thing. Um, eventually got out of the hospital. Um, and one of the things I thought was kind of interesting is I was feeling pretty good. Christian Sturm had come to the hospital to pick me up, which was really nice. Thank you, Christian. And, uh, but the doctor wouldn't release me uh, until my heart rate came down. When you get hypothermia, your heart just goes into overdrive. And, um, and he wouldn't, the hospital would not release me until my heartbeat uh, came back down to somewhat near normal. And I thought that was kind of interesting. So while I'm going through the hospital and then recovery at Christian's house, the airplane is floating downstream. It's, there's a current in that river and it floated downstream until it got to the Cabinet Gorge Dam. And you can actually see that little white dot up against the dam. Well, this happened on Friday and uh, the dam authorities and the people at the dam, they didn't really know what to do with this airplane that suddenly ended up on, their, on the face of their dam. And now the dam is kind of a terrorist target, I guess you could say. So, you know, they're very careful about just letting anybody come on there. And they had no way, uh, at least immediately, to get the airplane off of the face of the dam. So we're going to go through the weekend while they're trying to figure out what to do. Well, they tied the airplane off up against the dam. And you can see it's, it's pretty bangled up here. As it floated downstream, it got beat up. When I left it, the airplane was actually in excellent condition, as best I could tell, except for the hole in the float. Um, so they tied the airplane off against the face of the dam to keep it from moving. But over the weekend, it filled with water. Then the float slowly filled with water until it got heavy enough to break the ropes. And so I got a call Monday morning from the dam authority and they go, Bill, we're, we're sorry to tell you this, but we don't know where your airplane is. It, it broke the ropes and it's gone. It, it's, we don't know where it is. We don't know if it sank at the face of the dam or if it went over the dam. So now, you know, I'm somewhat recovered and there is no airplane, nothing, zero, zip, nada. They don't even know where it is. And so I went home with a Walmart bag with a, a change of clothes that Christian had bought at Walmart. And that is all. Lost my airplane, lost everything that was in the airplane, all the camping gear, all the camera equipment, the, my computer. And that was a pretty tough day. Um, that was a pretty, pretty tough loss. Turns out that uh, after the airplane broke the ropes, I'm going to speculate a little bit, but I'm sure that it didn't sink all the way to the bottom of the dam right away. It sunk until it found equilibrium 20, 30 feet down maybe. And now it's just kind of floating there 20, 30 feet down uh, under the water and it's subject to all the currents of the dam and the currents of course pulled it over the spillway. A couple of months later, they found a piece. It took literally two months. They found a piece of my airplane downstream. So we know that it went over the dam and that's what they found. It was about the size of a 55 gallon drum. It's from the firewall to the front of the back seat. One of the things that was very interesting on this is the rust that was on the airplane. Now, it had only been out of the water a day or two, and Spokane is kind of an arid, dry climate, that area, and, uh, and you can see all this rust. So it's kind of interesting that it rusted underwater. And I think that there's just so much air from the uh, dam in the water, the water is so uh, aerated that it actually allowed the airplane to rust underwater. So that was kind of interesting. So that's all they ever found. 
never one to give up. You know, I may not be the smartest guy on the block, but I'm pretty tenacious sometimes. And I wanted a super cub and I wanted to go to Alaska. So I started over. This is the firewall from the, the, uh, that they pulled out of the wall. Notice that it just stripped the motor mount off and stripped the uh, master relay and the starter relay and the battery and everything else that was on the firewall just got stripped clean. Uh, that's the uh, instrument panel with the Dynon boxes. You can see those a little bit. So lessons learned from this mishap. Uh, first one, obviously, if you, if you get in a survival situation, you have to, you have to keep your head, slow down, stop, think, um, one of the lessons that I learned was wear your survival vest. I had a survival vest in the airplane, but I thought, hey, I'm in the lower 48. I don't need to wear it. There's people everywhere. Well, the Northwest can get pretty unpopulated. And so I didn't have my survival vest. Probably the most critical lesson that I learned that I'd like to share with you is I never went through the mental process of going back in the airplane. So I never thought about it. I never thought about taking my life vest off hooking it to the float so it wouldn't float away, I could have swam underwater and grabbed a sleeping bag, could have grabbed my survival vest, could have grabbed the sat phone that was in the airplane. I never thought about going back in the airplane and getting stuff out. And that was a really critical uh, mistake uh, that I, that could have been life uh, threatening um, that I didn't make. So if this ever happens to you, don't forget, once you get out of the airplane, you can go back down and pull something out of the airplane. And uh, the other thing I learned was kind of a, th this, this didn't come until later, but don't compromise the mission. When you have a mission, and my mission was to go to Alaska, my mission wasn't to land on the Clark Fork River. Um, and so every time you land somewhere that you really aren't planning on it, just because, oh, it'd be cool, it'd be fun, I'm, I'm going to go down and do that, that'd be really neat, you're, you're taking a risk. And that could compromise your ultimate goal. And this was really prevalent when I took the airplane up into the Arctic Circle. As I was going up there, I saw all kinds of neat gravel bars and I just wanted to land so bad. But, you know, I thought, you know what, Bill, every time you do that, you're taking a risk that you're going to blow a tire, that you're going to miss a, a ditch that you didn't see and maybe do a pop prop strike or whatever. And now you've you haven't gone and to the Wiley Post Will Rogers Monument up to Barrow, you've got a busted airplane down near Bettles for no reason at all. And uh, when you've completed your mission, let's say you're on the way home, now you can land on every gravel bar you want to because your mission has been completed. So one of the lessons learned from this one is don't compromise your goal, um, just screwing around, I guess is maybe a good way to say it. So anyway, now I'm going to build another airplane and we're going to try again. So now there's uh, Nick Smith is uh, can't build airplanes. He's on a no compete clause for a while. And Jay DeRosier has uh, started up the company Javron. So I build a Javron Cub. Most of you guys have seen the thread building a Javron Cub on the site. Um, and uh, that was kind of you know, I started that thread and I, it was mostly just, I thought, well, if I learned something the hard way, there's no sense in everybody else making the same mistake. I'll just write it up on a thread on the site and maybe it'll help some other people. Uh, so anyway, finished the second cub. Uh, that took three years to build and I finished that in uh, 15, uh, June of 15 and went to Johnson Creek. There's the panel on that cub. And uh, so I did, you know, that's Dewey Moore there and I did mile high and I had a great time at Johnson Creek and then came back from Johnson Creek and put the floats on. Now we're trying to get ready to go to Alaska the next year. So in the fall, put the floats on, did some test flying. Great photo from Brad Thornburg that ended up on a magazine cover that fall. Over the winter, worked on the airplane and then in the spring, took it to Alaska. This time I was a little more careful not to compromise the mission, but we're not done yet. So took it to the Alaska Airmen's Trade Show and uh, we used it as a static display for uh, Javron so that he could try to sell some kits up there in Alaska. And that folks is as good as that airplane is ever gonna look. I mean, we spent three days cleaning it and polishing it and waxing it and it, it looked pretty good for the, for the show. And uh, that wasn't to last too terribly long. So now after the show, Jay DeRosier and I get in the airplane with all our camping gear and we head down to the Southeast. And uh, we're now going to uh, stay in the cabins and do exactly what I wanted to do all along. Had a great time. And then I took off out of Ketchikan and there was a 737 
opposite direction. So he's coming to land and I'm taking off right in his face. There's a bunch of traffic in the uh, channel uh, from super or from float planes taking off from Ketchikan. And as I took off, I thought, you know, you just need to focus on the highest threat, which right now is probably a midair. So let's not worry about the gear. Let's just make sure we don't have a midair collision. I didn't retract the gear. I got out of sequence, got out of my flow. Then when I got to the Jordan Lake, uh, which is a pretty small lake, I decided I'd stop in and take a look at the cabin there. And I was looking at the lake and it's pretty small. So I'm trying to figure out how to get in there and I'm trying to figure out what the winds are going to do to me. How am I going to beach the airplane? What kind of wind am I going to have when I beach? When I come off the beach to get out of there, how's the wind going to affect me? How am I going to get out of that lake? It's probably going to be a turning takeoff. What's the lowest? So I'm thinking through all this stuff. And in the process of doing all that, I did not do a gumps check. And so this is what it looks like. And you guys have probably all seen this, but when you land gear down, it's not pretty. The difference is for me, I was going really slow on this landing in Jordan Lake because it's a small lake. So it's a short field landing. So I'm slow. And the flip was really slow, slow enough that I had plenty of time to say some things I probably I'm going to have to ask forgiveness for. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I saw that water coming over the windshield and I knew immediately what I had done. I knew what had happened and it was just, go. Oh, my heart went all the way down to my throat. Fortunately, I could not get to my shotgun. Otherwise I'd have probably used it, but here we are underwater. So uh, got out of the airplane again. I'm getting pretty good at this now. This one again, though, wasn't nearly as violent, wasn't nearly as quick. So I had plenty of time to think about it. And it was kind of like, oh, crap. You know, I got to do this again. And so I got out of the airplane, got up on the floats, set my in reach off and started the rescue process. Got picked up by a helicopter from Timsco about 45 minutes later. Now, this situation was not... Uh, the temperature outside was probably 45 degrees. The lake was probably 42, 43 degrees, something like that. So it wasn't an immediate high threat survival situation. Yeah, if I hung around long enough, I'd get hypothermia, but we're talking hours, not minutes. Um, so anyway, this is what the airplane looks like underwater. Overnight, af after I got into town and got cleaned up and everything, the next day we come back out to start the uh, process of recovering the airplane. Um, the airplane drifted overnight uh, until it got up against uh, the outlet of, of the lake and now kind of grounded, bottomed out on the wing. And um, so uh, we had to tow it back to the center of the lake before we could flip it over. And uh, in the process of doing that, we, we, we damaged the uh, uh, cowling a little bit in one of the struts. So this is the lift out of the lake. Uh, I'll play this video for you. Um, what we did was we tied a rope, that's an ASMR uh, helicopter. Uh, Joe Hicks is my uh, manager of Tensco Helicopters, did a great job. We, we tied a rope to the, the back of the airplane, and we lifted the back of the airplane up, and we basically tried to flip the airplane and as much in the water as possible so that we didn't tie a lift the up. There's a fiber in the water, connecting the boat, and we tied a rope the uh, front of the airplane. And so we're going to pull on the front of the airplane while we're lifting the boat. And you can see a little bit of that uh, as we go here. Uh, so hey, Bill. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear me, but it's really hard to hear you talk over the sound from the video. Okay, let me. So if you mute the video, there you okay. go. There we go. That might be a little bit better. Perfect, so, thanks. Now you, thank you, Steve. Now you can see that we're lifting the tail up, but we don't want to lift it up very much because the wing is full of water. And, uh, and so now the water is draining out of the fuselage and it, it comes out of the um, uh, baggage compartment and through the cockpit area. And uh, so now we lift it up about as far as we can without getting the wing out of the water. And, uh, and now we start pulling with the boat to flip it over. So we got the airplane flipped over, we got it towed to shore, and now we're at shore, and this is kind of the area around the where we're at. Now you'll notice on the wing that we have put wing covers on it with those spoilers on it. Very, very critical. When the airplane is under the helicopter, the helicopter is going 40 or 50 miles an hour, you don't want the airplane to fly. And so it's really critical to keep the airplane from flying underneath the helicopter. And if you didn't know this, of course, you sign a release form from the helicopter company that says, if it gets unstable at any point, they're going to cut the, they're going to activate the guillotine and cut the rope and your airplane's just going to drop. And so you, you sign a waiver, no 
and that they are absolving the helicopter company of any responsibility uh, whatsoever. So this is what it looked like. Like I said, we busted the nose bowl open and you can see that the left strut is bent a little bit. Um, and of course we got everything out of it, drained all the fuel out of it, made it as light as we could. We bent the strut back down so that it would properly support the wing. And you can see here that did a pretty good job. Now, don't worry folks, I did replace that strut. Um, but uh, we got the airplane all buttoned up and uh, duct taped everything and got it ready for the uh, flight out. And, uh, and now this is the uh, helicopter uh, lifting the airplane uh, out of the lake. So, uh, pretty, pretty tense moment for me, um, you know, uh, watching those lift rings and hoping that they hold. Uh, so uh, Joe did a, again, Joe Hicks from Timsco Helicopters did a, a great job and, uh, and managed to get the airplane out. But one of the most scary parts for me of this whole thing is you're going to see here in just a moment, uh, the same perspective that I have that the camera has, the helicopter is above the ridgeline as he goes toward that ridgeline and my airplane is below the ridgeline. And so right about now, I don't have great depth perception. I'm thinking, no, no, you're going to scrape my airplane off on the ridge. Oh no, please climb or turn or do something. You're about to crash my airplane into the ridge. I was absolutely panicked. My heart's going about 200 beats a minute right here. And of course, I just don't have any depth perception. He's probably two miles from that ridgeline but I certainly don't know that. And uh, so anyway, he hauled it over to Temsco Helicopters in Ketchikan. And one of the uh, wing covers with the spoilers did come off just before he got to the final destination. And he said that it became unstable and he had to slow way, way, way down to just a couple miles an hour uh, to keep the airplane from uh, getting unstable. So they dropped the airplane at Timsco Helicopters and they, those guys were awesome. I can't say enough good things about Joe and, and the whole team at Timsco. They let me put the airplane in the hangar. And now I spent the next eight days working about 20 hours a day, drying it out, cleaning it out, working on avionics. Uh, all my avionics came apart. I salvaged most of the avionics, um, took them apart, cleaned them out, dried them out, and uh, put like a little thin film of uh, actually transmission fluid on the uh, circuit board so that they wouldn't corrode. Um, and then you can see the dent in the boot cowl. There's one at the top and one down toward the bottom there. Um, and then this is what it looked like after I did some work on it. And uh, so after about eight days of working on the airplane, I had to go back and work, uh, the lower 48 and work uh, a job for a couple of weeks and then came back up and uh, Dennis Wittenberg came back up with me and we had just about one more day's worth of work and the airplane was flyable and the airplane has flown since then uh, I've got over a thousand hours on it. You wouldn't know that it had been underwater unless, unless I told you or you saw this video. And it's just, everything's worked great. You know, there've been a few little minor things here and there, but on the whole, it, everything, you just never know it was underwater. And it's been fabulous and fantastic and uh, great fun to fly. So Dennis and I um, uh, uh, flew the airplane after that, and we'll talk more about that. But one thing I want to tell you about right now, uh, probably most incredible, one of the most incredible events in my life, other than my son being born and or being accepted into pilot training in the Air Force, something like that. Um, Doc Randy uh, saw and knew of the mishap and knew that I was in a world of hurt. And he formed a, a group, if you want to call it that, called a bunch of my friends and said, hey, we need to help Bill out here. So, um, so I the airplane's ready to go now. And, and I call the bank and say, hey, I need to make sure that my credit card is good to go. And I need to make sure that I have a really high limit, like $15,000, um, because I'm about to put a really, really big charge on my credit card. And uh, walked into the office at Timsco Helicopters and talked to Joe Hicks and said, uh, okay, Joe, I'm, I'm ready to pay my bill. And uh, he looked at me and he goes, you have a lot of friends. Your bill has been paid. And I tell you what, folks, I'm st I still choke up. I can't hardly tell that story. Um, that was amazing that, that everybody reached out and helped me out so much. And it was just incredible, an incredible moment in my life to, to find out how people would reach out and help you like that. So many thanks to Joe Hicks, Matt Nichols from Timsco, the whole Timsco team, uh, Steve Shrum, an old mechanic from that area, uh, helped me out. Uh, Dennis Bedford uh, from uh, up in Juneau helped me out. Uh, so many people, EMAG Air uh, overhauled my mags for me, 
overnight and air mailed them back. Uh, Bill and the whole Stoddard's team up in Anchorage uh, sent parts and overnighted them. And um, Javron, Jay DeRozier helped me out. Nick Smith helped me out. Um, it was just an amazing outpouring of, of compassion from the Super Cub group. So anyway, a great group of people. The airplane is flying again. So now let's talk about lessons learned from flipping an airplane twice. Obviously, the first lesson learned, always, always retract the landing gear after every takeoff immediately. Don't even think about it. Just suck it up. Um, another lesson learned, a uh, trash bag is better than a space blanket in your survival vest. Just take one of those big contractor uh, trash bags. You can slit a hole and stick your head through it, and it actually works a lot better than a space blanket. And before you start cutting holes in it, if you need it for something else, you can use it for something else. And then obviously, supercup.org is just a phenomenal group of people. So thank you, folks. Thank you very, very much. Okay, so back to down the ramp and into the salt water. The only time this airplane has been in salt water, had to make the takeoff there. Uh, and uh, then uh, Dennis and I immediately went over to the McDonald Lake cabin and uh, um, splashed around a little bit to get the salt off the airplane and then just did exactly what I had been doing prior to the mishap, uh, going to the cabin, sightseeing, fishing, camping, and, and having a great time. And so thank you, Dennis, for your help and your courage in flying with somebody that had just crashed an airplane. So now let's get to part two, the good stuff. Let's go to Alaska and fly and stay in these cabins. Um, a lot of people have asked, uh, how do you do? How is it that you're able to do uh, something like this? And the answer, folks, is I've been tremendously blessed to have a great job. I have five weeks of vacation a year now. Uh, at Southwest Airlines, and I can put a week in May, a week in June, a week in July, a week in August, and a week in September. So May to September, I've got vacation. And I'm very fortunate that I can take a week of vacation and stretch it out. Sometimes you got to take a little bit of a pay hit, but I can get almost three weeks off. So three weeks off in May, come home, work for a couple of weeks, three weeks off in June, come home, work for a couple of weeks, three weeks off in July, and just spend the whole summer up in Alaska, uh, flying to these cabins and camping and fishing. And uh, it's just been a phenomenal uh, life. And I've been, uh, it's now been five summers that I've spent doing these cabins up in Alaska. And just a, an absolutely magical experience um, to, to be able to do that. And I've been very fortunate that uh, Dennis Bedford has helped me out and I've been able to find a hangar to rent in Juno. Uh, summer so that when I go back to the lower 48 and work, uh, I have a place to put the airplane in where I can buy everything out of the air out with the camping gear and I don't have to worry about maybe the next work. Then when I come back up there, I jump seat on an airline, come back up into June, I'll pull the airplane's right there, put gas in it, go to the grocery store, and go right back to So really magical time. And since I've been able to spend that much time there, I've also had to tell some of my friends and say, hey, I've got all the camping gear, I've got all the fishing gear, I've got all the cooking gear. All you got to do is bring your clothes and your sleeping bag, come up to Juno, and we'll spend the week staying in these cabins, flying and fishing. And most of the time, most of the people that have come up have been pilots, and I've been able to put them in the front seat and let them experience float flying flying in Alaska. And it's just been a, a magical opportunity uh, to share my blessings. So, uh, so hangar it has been really helpful. And if you come up to Alaska and do these cabins, if you can find one, it really makes a big difference. Now, one of the things that a lot of people say is, how do you do this? How do you fly your airplane to Alaska? And I'd like to start off by saying thank you to Ted Waltman, uh, Super Cub guy has put together a phenomenal website called fly to Alaska or fly to 8k.com. So F L Y the number two and then AK.com. And he has put in one place on a website, all the rules and suggestions and tips and how to get through customs and everything in one place. Thank you, Ted. Phenomenal website. So if you want to know how to fly your airplane to Alaska, go here because it, it really is an incredible website and a great uh, resource. So thank you, Ted. So the next thing is you can go to supercub.org, go 
to the forum section, find the, the forum section titled Adventures, Stories, Journeys, and Musings, and then go in that uh, forum and you'll find my threads, Floats to Alaska 2016, 17, 18, and 19. And I've tried to include a lot of information in those threads on how to do this. Uh, there's uh, a list of things that are in my toolkit. There's a list of things that are in my survival list, a list of all the camping gear that I've taken, um, places to go, how to do it, and stuff like that. And so hopefully those would be a good resource for you as well. This map, and there's a link on those floats to Alaska threads on how to get this map, is a great resource. It, it tells us all the little squares are where all the cabins are in the southeast part of Alaska. Now, some of the cabins are in saltwater, but uh, the ones I go to typically are on freshwater lakes. So this is another phenomenal resource right here. Um, Tom Bass put together a website about all these cabins, and it's called uh, Public Lake Cabins ak.com and um uh, that there's the uh, uh uh website address and phenomenal resource folks uh you can click on any cabin on the left side of the uh page here and it'll take you to a page on that cabin where it has photos and um, a, a description from tom and then it also has a link where you get links directly to the forest service department where you can make a reservation uh to stay in the cabin so i use this website just about every day in the summer and i can't thank tom enough for putting this uh, website together it is a phenomenal resource and one you'll definitely want to bookmark and it's fun just to go look at even if you don't go to alaska it's fun to go look at all the cabins so uh, that's a pretty neat place so in the 70s and 80s primarily the forest service department built a bunch of cabins up in alaska um, most of them are 12 by 14 panabode cabins like this one and they rent them out for 50 bucks a night. Some of them are 60, 70 dollars a night. Uh, some of them are 30, 35 dollars a night. Um, and uh, so here's just some pictures of these cabins. Um, this one is near Juneau. This is Turner Lake West. We'll talk about it more later. This is the Lake Eva cabin. Really nice. Take a look at the inside of this cabin. It's 50 bucks a night. Uh, phenomenal. Um, and uh, so all of the cabins have four bunks in them, if you will. And the bottom bunk, you could put two people on if they were really cozy, uh, like married or something, or maybe kids. Um, so you could theoretically get six people in a cabin, but mostly you'd probably find four would be plenty. Um, so it's, this is where you put your uh, pad and your, uh, your air mattress and your sleeping bag. And all the cabins have a stove in them. Uh, this is the big Shaheen cabin here. It's a log cabin. Uh, this is a McDonald Lake cabin, has a big, huge front porch, which is really nice. Um, and uh, this is Young Lake South, again, one of the smaller Panabode cabins. This is the Red, Red Lake cabin. It's a two-story event and phenomenal. For 60 bucks a night, you can rent this. But the kicker is, most of these cabins, the only way you can get to them is with a float plane. So uh, that's what makes them so special, the Petersburg Lake cabin. You can see the inside again. You can see the bunks. And all the cabins will have a uh, place where you can do your cooking, a little countertop for your cooking, and a table where you can sit and eat. So here's, here's what the cooking table looks like when Chef Rusk is preparing his really lousy fish. The fish are good. The prep may not be so good. Um, and uh, the inside of another cabin. All the cabins have either a wood stove like this one or they have an oil fired stove. If they have an oil fired stove, you need to bring a couple of gallons of kerosene with you. Um, number one diesel. And uh, if they have a wood stove, the Forest Service Department provides the wood. Now, you may have to split it. And uh, here we keep putting some firewood. I'll tell you what. What you may not know, not only was Doc Brandy brilliant mentally, but he was also a world-class baseball player. The guy's uh, an athlete, and in fact, he's scholarshiped in baseball. So not only is he brilliant, he's also very physically coordinated. So there's Doc Randy chopping some wood for the cabins. And you guys all know Doc Randy. The cabins also all come with a boat. Um, they call it a skiff in Alaska. If I was down in Texas, I'd call it a John boat. They come with oars. And I can tell you folks, they 
don't row worth a poop. Um, so after rowing it one time, I went, okay, this is not going to work. And I did a little internet research and found a little two and a half horsepower Suzuki outboard motor that weighs 30 pounds. And now that goes in the Super Cub and uh, it works great, folks. Man, it's just, I can't say enough good things about that little Suzuki motor. I have probably spent more hours behind that motor than I have on my airplane. Uh, it gets you around the lake great and allows you to go to where the best fishing is. Okay. Little humor there. So one of the great blessings that I've had is, um, it's been, like I said, been able to share this trip with other people. And this is our very own supercub.org member, Doc Randy Korfman. He has come up to Alaska with me three times and uh, just it's been so much fun to have him come up and, and spend time with me each summer. Um, this was at the Virginia Lake Cabin, which has a dock, which is kind of neat. Mark Fiedler, um, he's come up a couple, three times. He enjoyed it so much. He is building a Jaffron Cub. Uh, he's already got a set of floats for it. They're painted to match the airplane. He'll probably finish his Cub in about March, and then he'll be up in Alaska staying in these cabins uh, as well. Uh, this is my mom, 80 years old. She came up and spent a week with me in Alaska. We had a ball, and uh, she just loves flying in the back of my airplane. You know, moms are great, and, and I'm so blessed to have one of the greatest moms. She just, oh, I hope when I grow up, I'm more like her. Um, Jay DeRosier, you know, makes this all possible by building these kits, and uh, he's he has been up to Alaska with me all five summers, and uh, it's been a great blessing to have him come up and spend time with me. Uh, Terry Mentor, a good friend from Portland, Oregon, came up and spent a week with me. We had a great time. She's a wonderful lady. Uh, this is Julie, uh, Doc Randy's wife. She came and spent a couple of days with Doc Randy and I, and what a blessing to have her come up and join us. We really uh, had fun. She's just a fantastic lady. Doc Randy married up. Um, my mom again, uh, uh, Dave Childs, a friend from Southwest Airlines, came up. We had a great time. He's a supercub.org guy and has a supercub, has his own grass strip down in Oklahoma. Uh, my sister has been up with me twice to Alaska and flown around in the back of the supercub. Uh, this is Eric Holstrom, supercub.org member. He has a cub on floats and uh, he couldn't get it up to Alaska this year because Canada was closed. And so he came up and spent a week with me. Uh, we had a great time. And so I'm sure. Uh, if Canada's open, he'll be up this coming year in his Cub. Uh, my nephew, Kyle, uh, former Army Ranger, came up. They had a great time fishing. And uh, Garth Gibson uh, came up. He's, super, he's a uh, uh, Southwest Airlines guy, and uh, he's probably going to be building a Cub in the future. He, he really had a great time. Tom Anderson, a friend from Poplar Grove. Tom's in his late 70s, but you'd never know it. The guy's in great shape. He's built several airplanes. We had a great time. He's been up a couple times with me. This is Brian Maylard, my nephew. Brian Crockett from Southwest Airlines came up, had a great time. Uh, Jay again. Uh, Greg Campbell, a lot of you guys know from the Super Cub website, he built a Smith Cub uh, with some help from Nick. Thank you, Nick. Um, and uh, Greg just built a beautiful airplane. And uh, so he came up and spent a week with me. Uh, Mark Fiedler again. Uh, Jay DeRosier. Our very own Doc Randy, like I said, has been up three times. This is my good friend, Buck Wyndham from Poplar Grove. Outstanding pilot, former fighter pilot. Uh, well, you're, you're always a fighter pilot. You know, you're never a former fighter pilot. Once a fighter pilot, always a fighter pilot. But Buck came up and uh, spent a week with me. And uh, super, super guy. Wrote a book about his experience flying the A-10 in the Gulf War and in the sandbox. Uh, if you get a chance to read it, it's called Hogs in the Sand. It's a great book. Um, and uh, of course, everybody knows Dennis Wittenberg, uh, Tom Anderson. A lot of you know Mark Ruscha. He came up and spent a week with me. Uh, Mark was one of the first supercub.org guys. Uh, he was at the first gathering at New Holstein with Boz and Dave Tungi and some of the original supercub guys. Great guy. Um, so anyway, it's been a great uh for me, an opportunity to share my blessing with some people. So one of the best cabins out there is the uh, Swan Lake Cabin. And it is, excuse me, it's near the Lacante Glacier. This is the, the Lacante Glacier, and it's a place you'll definitely want to, to go see as you uh, head over toward the Swan Lake Cabin. The Swan Lake Cabin is, you know, if there are three or four top cabins, Swan Lake is either number one or number two. That's the Peterson Glacier right behind it. 
and uh, phenomenal uh, cabin, but it sits up at about 1500 feet. And uh, this is kind of the uh, a video of coming in and you come into the lake, you do a 180 in the valley, and then you come back in between these trees to land most of the time because that's the uh, direction of the wind. Um, so that's kind of what it looks like. This is what it looks like going in uh, through the channel uh, into Swan Lake. Um, Swan Lake sits up at about 1,500 feet. Now, the southeast part of Alaska, Ketchikan, Juneau, Sitka, that area, is a rainforest, folks, and it rains a lot, and it's cloudy a lot. And so it's not uncommon to have a 15, 1,800-foot ceiling. Well, this lake is at 1,500 feet, so if you have an 1,800-foot ceiling, you've got about 300 feet between the, the clouds and the lake. And so you come in this channel, and a lot of times the tops of the mountains are completely obscured, and so you're flying through a tunnel here uh, to get into this lake. And um, so it's a really neat place, but it is possible to get trapped in this cabin because you go in and on a nice day, let's say you wake up and there's a 1200 foot ceiling. Well, if there's a 1200 foot ceiling, you're 300 feet in the clouds. And uh, so it's pretty easy to get stuck at this cabin. So one of the things that happens in the Southeast is you do spend a lot of time flying in the rain and flying in less than optimum, you know, clear in a million days. So I'm going to take just a real quick chance to talk a little bit about low weather flying here. Okay. And these are lessons that I've learned, a lot of them the hard way. First off, don't do it. But if you have to, the first lesson is never lose your horizon. If you're following the shoreline uh, and using that as a, a horizon, don't lose sight of it. Okay. Uh, never lose your horizon. Another lesson learned is a lot of times you're flying along and you're over, say, the ocean, big water, and you're, the cabin is tucked back in the, in the, the uh, behind a ridge line or, you know, on, on land. And it looks like there's just a wall of clouds there. And so you think, well, there, it, it, it's just walled in. I can't get there. And so you want to do a 180. But one of the things you'll learn is you need to go right up to the clouds because when you get close, you find that those clouds have depth. And it's not just one wall of clouds, it's actually a bunch of clouds, and you can weave your way around between the clouds and get where you're going frequently. So you have to put your nose all the way up against the window pane before you do that 180 uh, and say, this isn't going to work. Um, I Don't ever cross big water without being able to see the other side. If you need to get from Baranoff Island across Chatham Strait, and it might be 15 miles across that ocean that straight to the other side, you need to be able to see the other side before you start across. Otherwise, you're going across water with no horizon, and that's not smart. So let's say you do head out across that. You can see in the distance a little bit of, of land, so you do have a horizon. The next thing is, that's not a great horizon and you're out over the water, you need to pay attention to your altimeter because it is possible to descend without even realizing that you're descending and you can descend all the way into the water. And trust me, if you hit the water at 100 miles an hour, it's not going to be a landing. Um, so as you go out across big water, I'm a firm believer that, you know, I started out at 300 feet and every five seconds I look inside and make sure I'm still at 300 feet until I get to the other shore. Um, okay, the next lesson, and believe me, I've learned this the hard way, always turn toward your horizon. If you decide, okay, this is getting crummy, I need to do a 180 and go back, you need to move away from your horizon, move out away from shore a little ways, for instance, and then when you make your turn, you turn back toward shore, you turn back toward your horizon. Always, always, always turn toward your horizon. Uh, that was a pretty scary moment for me when I didn't do that, and I learned that lesson the hard way. Obviously, you always need a backup plan, uh, someplace where you know you can get in if the weather does turn out to be worse than you thought. Don't cross a ridge if you can't see the other side. You know, if you get up to the ridge and the clouds are right up to the ridge, if you can't see beyond it, don't cross it, obviously. Um, it takes about 80 seconds or I'm sorry, it takes about 45 seconds at 80 miles an hour to go a mile. And one of the lessons you learn when you get up there and you start flying in some of the rain and some of the low weather is it's not as bad as you think it is, okay? So a guy gets in the airplane, he's new up there with me and we're flying along and he's like, man, I'm really uncomfortable. This, this visibility is terrible. And I go, okay, pick that furthest point that you can see out there. See that little peninsula sticking out? Yeah, okay, hack the clock. 
by the time we get to that peninsula, three minutes has gone by. And it's, it's like, okay, you have five miles of visibility here, but we're not accustomed to flying in low visibility in the low 48 because we walk outside most of the time and we look at it and we go, hey, today's a nice day. I think I'll go flying. And so you don't fly when the weather's not perfect. Uh, when you get up and you start taking long cross countries up into Alaska, up into the Arctic Circle, up into Canada, north of Hudson Bay, things like that, you're going to find some low weather. And one of the things that I learned is that a lot of times it's not nearly as bad as I thought it was. Okay. Um, and uh, so three miles visibility seems terrible in the lower 48. Uh, that's VFR. And you get up into Alaska and you discover that, wow, okay, it did take two minutes to get to that peninsula. And so I do have more than, you know, more than a mile visibility. Um, here's an oddball one. The water is not zero. And I haven't figured this one out yet. Maybe somebody can explain it, but you can take off of Juno or Ketchikan with a proper altimeter setting. You can be going along and your, your altimeter says you're at 200 feet and you're out over the ocean and you will go right by a boat at mast height on a sailboat and go, okay, that mast is not 200 feet. How I am not 200 feet above the water. I'm 30 feet above the water, but my altimeter says I'm 200 feet up. One of the lessons I learned in running some low weather up there is the water is not zero. I don't know why it's anywhere from 120 to 150 feet. And so if you think you're you know, doing good because you're 300 feet on your altimeter setting, you're not that high above the water. Okay. You can also go from one lake to another. So you take off, it's pretty crummy. You can see over there, hey, there's another lake over there. I'll go over there, you go over there. Because remember, a lake is a runway. And I have full camping gear in the airplane, I have a tent, I have everything else. And so um, I can go to that lake and, and if I need to, I can land and stay right there. So I get to that lake and I go, oh, I, I can get to the next lake. And, and I can see that lake over there. So you go to that lake and then you kind of lake hop from one to the other until you get to the big water. And once you get to the ocean, uh, Chatham Strait, Stevens Passage and you know various things like that. Once you get to the big water, typically the weather's a lot better. So now you're starting to see what going into Swan Lake might look like with clouds. And the arrow is pointing to the lake at the end of this channel. And I need to see that before I stick my nose in this channel. A window right there. That's the lake I'm going to, so I know I can make it all the way to the water. You don't stick your nose in this channel unless you can see the water on the other side. And put your nose against the window pane in order to see through sometimes. Because this channel is tight enough that a 180 in here would be, might be kind of uh, not, not possible. Well, this is going into Swan when the weather can be, uh, can be pretty bad. But it's still it's just one of the most beautiful cabins and one of the most beautiful lakes in the southeast of Alaska. And if you get a chance to go up there, go to Swan. It's worth it. This is what the inside of the cabin looks like. It's just a beautiful cabin. You'll see the little ladder in the background. There is a, a loft up there where you can put a couple more people. Uh, this is some of the scenery that you uh, will see, you know, from Swan. Uh, it's in a bowl and just stunning looking. That's the Swan Lake cabin. Yeah. Some of the scenery will help Swan Lake. Uh, this video was done by Buck. He came, my friend Buck Wyndham came up, and Buck's so talented in everything he does. And one of the things that he's good at is photography. And he brought his drone up to, uh, a little his drone up to Alaska. And uh, so we put this video together. It's got footage from several different camera angles. And I really appreciated Buck doing that. Uh, we put a camera on the back, better bar. Get looking back and you know, switch the camera angle to the outside. And we put a camera on the front, get some footage, and put some stuff on the front. And it's there. And, well, this was filmed at Swan Lake. And it's kind of a neat little video. Uh, I love the water. It's great to move off the floats there. So anyway, that's Swan. The next really neat cabin that you definitely want to stay at is Turner West, Turner Lake West. It's pretty close to Juneau, about a half hour flight. And, but once you're on this cabin, you, you'd think you were a thousand miles from the nearest human being. Stunning scenery, 
wonderful cabin built in about 1939. In fact, this cabin has been around so long, there's entries in the logbook. Each cabin has a little logbook where you can write, hey, we came to this cabin, we spent a week, we did this, we had a great time. And you can go back and read all these entries. And there's entries in there where people say, yeah, we're the third generation to do our honeymoon in this cabin. My grandparents did their honeymoon in this cabin. My parents did their honeymoon. And now my new bride and I are doing our honeymoon in this cabin. It has a dock and you can see uh, in the background over there, the waterfalls right across the lake. You can see and hear those waterfalls when you're staying in this cabin. And uh, so it's just, just a magic place. This is the inside. It does have a fireplace and an oil stove, both, uh, but in this case, since it has an oil stove, the Forest Service Department does not provide firewood. So you need to bring some if you wanna have a little fire in the fireplace. Uh, this is some of the uh, scenery from the uh, cabin there. Uh, my nephew, when the salmon are running, the stream that runs between this lake and the ocean, uh, uh, great place to uh, catch some fish. So, Kyle bag his first salmon here. Okay, Kyle. <laughs> we had salmon for dinner that night. George Campbell took me fishing. George, you guys know, is one of the supercub.org family members and a great guy lives in Haines. He took me steelhead uh, fishing to one of his special places. And uh, George is one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. And uh, so this is me catching my first. <laughs> so that was quite an experience. If you go up to the Southeast, look George up. Nicest guy you'll ever meet and, uh, and just a phenomenal individual, great resource. Uh, he can help you if you get in trouble. Okay, so one of the things that happens with float planes, you guys, if you're a float plane pilot, man, you just have to fight the women off. You will fly with some of the most beautiful women because they just love float plane pilots. And so you're just going to have this bevy of women that that, you, that just want to fly with you all the time. You're going to have to fight them off. It's an incredible thing that, you know, only happens to float plane pilots. So guys, you're just going to have to get, uh, get on floats and uh, and fly with some of these gorgeous ladies and can you tell there's a little bit of sarcasm there? But you do get to fly with some wonderful women and, uh, and you know, being a float plane pilot is awesome. You might recognize this photo if you've gotten your calendar. This photo was selected for the 2021 calendar. And uh, this was taken by my good friend, Mark Fiedler. Uh, and yeah, we were catching salmon when that uh, photo was taken. It was taken at the Young Lake South Cabin right here. And uh, it's just, an incredible place up there, an incredible experience. This is the Sitco cabin over on Chichikov Island near Baranoff, near Sitka. Um, and notice that it's open uh, around the bottom of the cabin as opposed to see how the vegetation is much closer on this cabin. Um, this photo was taken at, the, uh, at that cabin, at the Sitco cabin. Uh, again, just stunning scenery. Uh, yeah, I clean fish right on the float. I use my paddle as a cutting board. I'm a weight freak. I didn't want to carry a cutting board. Why do that when I can use my paddle? If you do clean your fish on the float like this, you got to make sure you wash the float really, 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 really good because you don't want to attract bears. And also blood is pretty corrosive. So if you do uh, do this, probably not a recommended technique, but it works for me. Um, be sure you clean your float really well. Okay, so you've seen this canyon before. This white streak over on the kind of right side is a waterfall. So take a look at that as we... As this journey. One of the things that's been fun for me is, is teaching guys when they come up to fly with me uh, what I've learned. And uh, canyon turns are one thing that we don't really get to experience a lot in the lower 48. Uh, but you'd be amazed at how tight a, a, a cub can turn. I mean, it just pivots on its own rear. Uh, uh, and so you can make some pretty neat canyon turns and go into some really stunningly beautiful places. Another beautiful cabin is the Baranoff cabin uh, on Baranoff Island. Uh, and uh, the scenery at this cabin is just phenomenal. Big waterfall right across the lake. Good fishing at this cabin. Um, just absolutely magic, uh, magic place. Uh, waterfall right across the lake that you can hear and see from the cabin. 
And of course, one of the other great things about the Southeast is when it's not rainy and raining uh, is uh, enjoying an outdoor fire and, and uh, just, just seeing and uh, enjoying that aspect of going to Alaska. So uh, magic experience uh, flying up there and Lord willing, I'm hoping that I get a chance uh, to go back. Well, Jay. Darn good trip, buddy. This was fun. <laughs> so I'm going to play this video and we'll turn the volume way down and I'll talk a little bit through it. We're almost done, folks. Uh, Here is a little well, some of you may have seen this video. Uh, most of the time when somebody comes up to visit, um, I try to do a little video for them so that they can go home and have something they can show their family and friends and say, hey, this was my trip to Alaska. It was so cool. We did this and went to these cabins and stuff. 2021, I kind of got a little tired, a little burned out. So instead of doing videos, everybody, each individual that came up, kind of just did this combined video, uh, if you will. And I didn't do any narration on it. So it was a I did switch in 2021 uh, to the GoPro Hero 8. And that camera, folks, is really phenomenal. It does a great job, but it has internal stabilization. Oh, Jay and I saw this bear on our trip, and we were in the boat, so we managed to really photograph him and get close and everything, because we were safe, and all we had to do was just turn the boat away. And we Bears have not been a problem, folks. They're just, it's just not really an issue. Um, and if you're staying in the cabin, it's pretty unlikely they're going to bust the door down and come in the cabin. So, if you have a concern about or something in Alaska, don't. It's not an issue. Again, you get to see some of the people. Fuel the cub. This awesome day in Petersburg. Some of the people that came up and spent time with me. As we came in, the Baron was like, you know, this is the last thing we're going to get. And here he's just going to go. And he's just going to go. Not good. So it's pretty neat. See these cameras. I just can't tell you what a phenomenal experience. Best time again to be able to go up here. This is uh, the police department, the local sheriff's department, has been around the cabin. He dropped into the cabin. We were back in there. I saw his little chat uh, with him. That was kind of neat. Mark Feet is a uh, pretty, pretty good supervisor. Show. And uh, so here he is. We did some great fishing there. It was absolutely staggering how good the fishing was. Uh, Sitka is a wonderful town. I highly recommend it. Just be careful. Very cold for me. This is part of Misty Peepers, and you've seen this before. It's just so much fun. It's so much fun. Okay, let's open it up and uh, Shoot some questions at me and shoot me down. Bill, that was fantastic. Well, thank you, Steve. I hope that you guys enjoyed it and got something out of it. And hope you got motivated to build an airplane, put it on floats, and go to Alaska. And you know, let me say this real quick, Steve. Most of those cabins are not used by float plane pilots. They're actually used by somebody that, you know, you take your family, you're, you and your two kids, you go to Juneau, you charter a float plane, they take you into the Turner Lake West cabin, you spend a week there, there and they come and pick you up and bring you back out. And that's how most of the cabins are actually used. So you don't have to have a float plane to go see and stay in some of these cabins. Hey, this guy, some rando dude, 
uh, texted me and said he wanted to say something. So I, okay. I let him on. I can, I can knock him off if it becomes a problem. My brother. My brother. <laughs> hey, bro. Listen, I just wanted to say, uh, first of all, thanks for the kind words. But for you folks that uh, don't know this community very well, this group of people are uh, incredible. And uh, when Bill had his accident uh, with the floats or with the... Well, uh -oh. ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Randy said he was having trouble with his computer earlier. He needs to, he needs to pay his internet bill. <laughs> but I'll finish what he was saying. For people who have an aviation... Oh, sure he's back. And he's okay. back. Okay. Um, all right, we missed all of that, Randy. Start over. <laughs> Good. So you've had time an, to practice. It's an incredible community. And uh, uh, when the first when the accident happened and I was I found out uh, within within two hours, I had people coming out of the woodwork to contribute to try to make this ease the pain that Bill had with this. And, you know, to me, it was so reassuring and uh, reaffirms that what we have in aviation is a community of people that are just super and compassionate and uh, uh, so dedicated to aviation and helping other people. So I want to thank everybody that helped out with that. Um, and, and then lastly, just to say that uh, in addition to Bill being a terrific aviator, He's a great mentor up there and uh, opened our, opens up our eyes to a lot of possibilities that otherwise we wouldn't be able to see. And uh, uh, we're hoping he's going to come and give this talk at the great Minnesota Aviation Gathering, uh, May the 14th and 15th down in Minnesota. So we'd like you to come down and, and be a part of it. So, uh, so much for the plug. Steve, thank you so much for uh, arranging this for Bill tonight. Just a super presentation. Really, really, Bill. It, it was awesome. And, uh, you know, I, I really like the fact that you're the bookend man, that you that you did the very <laughs> first one of these presentations, and now you did the last one for this year anyway. We we do have uh, my bride, Laura Johnson, is uh, currently contacting numerous people to work out the schedule for next year. And uh, she has a couple, couple folks lined up, which I think we're going to be very interesting. So we're trying to do at least three a week. And um, oh, be careful. I see some of you on the list here. Who's here? <laughs> oh, there you go. Good <laughs> wink. <laughs> Steve, we'll talk you into it. So let me see. We had a couple questions, Bill, uh, back during the. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to post them. Um, but mostly it's just people, mostly it's just fan people saying how awesome you are. But, and I'm not going to go through any of that. But um, a couple questions were when we got back to when you had the original flip um, and what, what are your thoughts about helmets and, and what, would that have been an advantage for you in that situation? You know, Steve, I, I don't know if it would have in that particular case because I kind of did a face plant. And what happened is, you know, I turned my head just a little bit to look out the side. And so when I went forward, you know, I hit this eye is what planted. And a lot of people said, well, obviously your shoulder harnesses didn't work, you know, or they, they were loose or something. And uh, about 12 hours after the mishap, after I got to Christian's house, um, you could see the bruises um, on, for both my shoulder straps and my lap belt. Uh, uh, so it obviously worked. I mean, I was, I was bruised up, but it was pretty violent. And there's just so much flex in the human body uh, that, that I flexed enough to smack my face on the uh, instrument panel. I know that I was never unconscious, otherwise I would have drowned. Um, but uh, but I, I don't know if a helmet would have happened, unless it was a full face helmet, I don't know that it would have helped in that particular instance. But I do think there is a lot of merit to uh, the helmet um, issue. So it's certainly something to think about. Somebody asked a question too, um, and, and I was, I'm not sure the exact context, but they were asking, how do you know when something's salt and something's not salt, when you were talking about salt water or not salt water? Um, Tom Bass's website is really good. He's hit all the cabins that are on his website are freshwater. Um, and uh, there's one or two that he indicates that it's 
it's brackish water. Um, so that's one way. And then when you fly over it, you can, you can pretty much see that the water is running, you know, flowing toward the ocean and you can pretty well figure out uh, that it's fresh water. Um, now, the southeast of Alaska is a little different. They do get so much rain there that uh, the, the salinity, salinity if, if I'm saying that right, the salt content of the water, at least on the top few inches of water, is probably a little bit low. Um, so it's more brackish for float plains than, than pure salt water. Cool. So uh, the, there's another question too. How long were you in the water on that first flip over? Had you, you, I, think you, I think you said 25 minutes, but I don't remember what. Yeah, total time, I think from the time that I went underwater until I got um, out of the water was close to 25 minutes. By the time, you know, I sent out a text and figured out what I was going to do. And then I I didn't say this because I, you know, I was trying to keep it short, but at one point I swam over and picked up my uh, clothing bag, which had come out of the airplane. It was sitting on the back seat and it had actually come out of the airplane. And I thought, well, maybe there's something in there I can use. So I swam over and picked it up and then swam back to the airplane. Well, that was kind of dumb actually, because there wasn't <laughs> anything in there that I could use. And all I did was spend more time in the water. And then I sat on the float for a while, kind of going, is this airplane drifting toward shore? Because it'll be better to just stay up here and drift than it will be to get back in that ice water and swim. And eventually I figured out that, no, it's not getting any closer to shore. I landed right in the middle of the river and, and this airplane is going right down the middle of the river. Um, and then for, again, the lady happened to stop on the side of the road. And, and so I knew where the road was and I had somebody to swim to, so to speak. And so, yeah, it was about 25 minutes. And according to the internet research, I should have been dead at about 15. So I was very, very fortunate on that. Yeah, the internet always kills people early, just so you know. Um, the, <laughs> no, um, but you know, I thought it was interesting that you were talking about when the, the second flip over that you said, oh, the water was above me 43 degrees here. So what was the big deal? You know, I could have stayed in this for a few hours. So what do you think the water temperature was on that first flip? Yeah, it, it was probably just above freezing because it was all snow melt. Wow. You know, and like I said, I flew through a couple of snow showers just before I had the mishap. And so, yeah, that river was just snow melt. And so, and so somebody asked earlier on, uh, Alexander, uh, best dressed uh, guy on Zoom, asked early on, um, what, uh, if you, do you, did you ever figure out what it was you hit or when you hit it or anything like that? Not a clue. You know, one of the things uh, when I got back, I talked to Joe Berkmeyer, who was the manager uh, of Bauman Floats for many years and super knowledgeable guy. And we were just kind of visiting about the whole mishap. And he postulated that maybe I hit something on the takeoff uh, because I came out of Sealy Lake and it was really rough water. And, uh, and so if I had hit something, I wouldn't have known it because it was so rough. And so he postulated that maybe the float had been opened up on takeoff so that when I landed when I touched down it acted as a scoop and just immediately uh, ripped the bottom of the float open because there was a pretty big gaping hole on that uh, float that had been ripped uh, ripped open on that float and uh, so I suspect what happened you know is you instantly get a ton of drag and now uh, with the drag it's going to pivot the airplane which is just going to dig it in and cause it to flip um, sure pretty pretty violent I, I really don't know what happened I went from hey, this is a beautiful place. This is so cool. I, I'm such a stud to, oh my God, I'm underwater. <laughs> <laughs> I These lessons from happen a quickly. Level. <laughs> yeah, I went from a high level. <laughs> hey, um, so somebody is curious to, uh, is that the 31, do you have the 31 gallon belly pod on your plane, the Landis belly pod? It's yeah, so. 32. So what is your, uh, so what's your range then with that, the engine you well, have? That, gi that gives me 68 gallons and, um, and I run, I burn about seven to 7.2 gallons an hour uh, on the burn. So, you know, that gives me close to nine hours worth of fuel. Uh, and that, Are you 160 uh, horse or 180? 180. But right, with, so you're running on just three cylinders then to get the seven? <laughs> well, you know, with the electric transmission, <laughs> I'm in those P mags and it, it is amazing. I actually run lean of peak, even though it's carbureted. I've got a full, you know, I've got four EGTs and four CHT uh, indications, and I can actually run the engine lean of peak. And I have been for the last thousand hours. 
So that's how I get my burn down. But yeah, that, that much fuel is really nice because it allows me to go nonstop from Bellingham to Ketchikan. So I don't have to land in Canada. I can just fly right over the top of Canada. Don't have to clear customs. Uh, don't, you know, you file a flight plan and go. It's wonderful. So how many days do you dehydrate before you do that trip? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can it more than one bottle. <laughs> <laughs> what? How long is that? How long does that take? Six or eight hours, doesn't it? That's about six hours. That's about a six-hour flight. Yeah. So when I get up to Ketchikan, I still got close to three hours worth of fuel. Um, so you know, it's not like it's close or I'm I'm pushing it. I, I'm not only pushing fuel. That's not. Let me look and see if anybody else uh, has any other questions here. Um. <laughs> So we got. Uh, there was a troublemaker on there too. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, is it really possible to build a Javron Cub without a manual for a beginner? I think so. Uh, you're going to end up having to get some help here and there. Uh, you learn as you go. Um, you know, my first Cub was very similar to a Javron Cub. It was a Smith Cub, same basic thing, and. You know, yeah, I built a few model airplanes, but I'm, I'm not an a and I'm not an IA or anything like that. And I just learned as I went. When I hit something that I didn't know how to do, I found somebody that did and, and got their help. And so I bought some beer and pizza and various other things and vowed that when I did my second airplane, I would try to pay it full. And thus the big thread on the Super Cub website of, of my experience trying to help others. Which, which by the way, folks, if you haven't seen uh, Bill's building thread or multiple building threads on supercup.org on building the Javron. Um, one of the most popular threads on the website and just incredibly detailed and well done. I mean, just a very valuable resource and, and hopefully will be for many people for eons, um, you know, beyond both of our lifespans, which is not in my next 10 year plan to figure out how to make sure that happens. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so somebody asked too, uh, what, what RPM are you burning seven gallons an hour in a 180 horsepower engine, like 1400? Uh, <laughs> no, that's 2400. Uh, I, I'm typically going 2400. That gives me about 103 to 104 miles an hour. I'm running at an 80, 84. Wait, 104 miles an hour on amphibs? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I'm running an 8443 prop. Um, and I'm still off the water, even max gross at 20, 25 seconds. It's just an amazing airplane. The Cub, Super Cub's an amazing airplane. It really is. And that's not a hot rodded 180 horse. It's a standard 180 horse engine. Um, you know, it's not, I'm not running 10 to 1 pistons or anything like that. But again, the electronic ignition makes a huge difference. It's a gallon an hour. Um, and so, yeah, I can, I can run 2400 RPM, leaned out um, at about 7.2. If I'm depending sometimes 7.4. If I go up high, I've actually run at 6.8, 6.9 uh, occasionally. Uh, so it's, it's just magic. So uh, uh, somebody who it, it appears like an anonymous person asks, did you ever sustain any injuries in Alaska, like cutting yourself when cleaning a fish or anything <laughs> like that? <laughs> That's my brother, Doc, hitting me again. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I filleted my finger one time. And I'll tell you the story on that. It's bleeding pretty good. And I'm kind of nervous about this thing. I'm thinking I need some stitches or something. And Doc looks at me and he goes, oh, don't worry. All bleeding stops. <laughs> All bleeding stops. Well, yeah, when you run out of blood. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. And then I've managed to whack myself with an ax, you know, and uh, bandaged myself up on that one. Um, I do carry a, a pretty thorough first aid kit because sometimes I'm a little like tool the Tim man or Tim the tool man on TV. I'm always managing to hurt myself somehow. So I, and I have a question. So, you know, you've used your, you've hit the, uh, the rescue button on your spot or your in reach a few times. Do, is there a point like the insurance company that they call you and say, you can't have one of these devices anymore <laughs> or uh, <laughs> how does that work? Well, yeah, probably, probably would be. Um, the first one, uh, uh, I actually kind of self-rescued, if you will. Uh, eventually, the fire department and the uh, local county sheriff did come to that area and saw the airplane floating down the river. But by then, I was on in an ambulance on my way to the hospital. Uh, the second one, 
uh, you know, I was able to, with the inReach, I was able to text that I'm okay. You know, hypothermia will be a problem in several hours, but I'm fine right now. And uh, so they contacted the local helicopter comp company, Timsco Helicopters, and, uh, and Timsco flew a helicopter out to Jordan Lake, and there I am sitting on the bottom of the float, you know. Um, so rather than do the helicopter lift, what they did in that case was they uh, dropped a guy off, and he got in the boat because there's a cabin on the lake with a skiff like all the rental cabins and he got in the skiff and rode out to me and picked me up and rode me back to shore and then the helicopter was able to come in and land near shore and and i was able to climb in it and, and get out that way hmm. amazing yeah you know i i gotta say bill um you know i i don't think there's many people that watch this and, and think a couple things one is that it'd just be i, I mean the, the videos, just amazing scenery, obviously, that you get to see and, uh, you know, the, the ability. And, and I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but some of those cabins are sort of threatened right now because there's no way to get to them except via fault plane. And, um, and so the Forest Service is, or, or whoever is in charge of all that up there is deciding, you know, maybe these are not cabins we should maintain anymore. And uh, yeah, so, thank you. So you need... Up. Yeah. You need more people to get up there and, and take advantage of those things. Right. But, you know, um, you know, it, it's, I guess the other thing that's inspirationally important to me is yeah. that you are willing to talk about how things went wrong. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of people are not willing to talk about that. I mean, you know, I've sent those little flip-flop hats. I've sent out 250 of those things. And I'll bet there's 10 people that talk about them. You know, and and so so I think it's really valuable. We greatly appreciate you being willing to talk about the things that happened to you. Well, thank you, Steve. And needless to say, and I think I've told you this before, you know, it, it's hard sometimes because I don't want to be remembered as the guy that crashed two airplanes. I'd like to be remembered as the guy that helped people and, you know, shared his blessings and things like that. And so if you well, you can forget about that, but <laughs> about it, that's what everybody remembers, you know. It's like, oh, yeah, that's the guy that crashed two airplanes, and it's kind of hard sometimes to talk about it, you know, because that's not how I want to be remembered. But hopefully, maybe, maybe some of those lessons learned will go into the back of somebody's head, and maybe it'll help. And uh, no. yes, the cabins are threatened, and uh, we do need to get utilization of those cabins up uh, to try to keep keep them out there because it's a just an incredible resource and a phenomenal vacation and a, a beautiful place to go. So hopefully we'll encourage more people to do that. That's fantastic. Well, Bill, thank you again so much for being the bookend guy, starting this, uh, these, with these Wednesday night presentations and closing them off for the year. And, uh, and, and hopefully I'm, I'm hoping to do some of these next year, but I'm I'm hoping that we have better things to do and are able to get out and do other stuff. And and uh, my my dream is that everybody will will I'll show up here one night and there'll only be a couple people here, and and because <laughs> everybody's out flying or doing something else. So hopefully that's the case in 2021. And uh, Merry Christmas to you and Merry Happy Christmas New Year to all of you out there. And yeah. uh, thanks for thanks for tuning in tonight. And remember, tell your friends about these. And we'll see you all next year. God bless. Thank you, Steve. Good night. Good night.